Five Mysterious Unsolved Cases, Part 2 Number 1. The Jameson Family The first case on our list is extremely strange and still remains unexplained over six years later. The Jameson family, which consisted of Bobby, his wife Sherilyn, and their six-year-old daughter Madison, went missing on October 8, 2009. The Jamesons had decided that they wanted to move out of their lakefront property to make a fresh start in a new area. On the morning of October 8th, the family traveled 30 miles from their home near Eufaula to a rural area in Oklahoma in hopes of buying a 40-acre plot of land. They drove their white pickup truck to the isolated Sans Bois Mountains, but never returned. On October 16th, the family's abandoned vehicle was found on the side of the road by a Latimer County Sheriff. Inside the locked truck were the Jameson's wallets, IDs, cell phones, a GPS system, around $32,000 in cash, and even the daughter's beloved dog, who was on the edge of starvation. Police quickly launched a huge search operation but found nothing. It wasn't until over four years later when they discovered the family's skeletal remains around three miles from where their truck was abandoned. An autopsy was performed, but the remains were in such a bad state that the cause of death could not be determined. On the day before their disappearance, security cameras from their home caught the Jamesons as they loaded up their truck. Investigators claimed the pair looked as if they were in a trance-like state, walking from their house to the truck over 20 times without speaking to each other once. The Jamesons were also very thin and emaciated around the time they went missing, which has led to theories that the pair were hooked on crystal meth. However, police found no drugs or drug paraphernalia in the home. Months prior to the disappearance, the Jamesons had become very paranoid and told some of their friends and family that their house was haunted and explained that they had seen spirits. Bobby even informed a pastor of the spirits and had asked whether he could obtain special bullets to shoot them. The Jamesons had both suffered with depression throughout their lives, and Sherry Lynn had also suffered from bipolar disorder. This photo of six-year-old Madison was taken in the mountains and was found on Bobby's cell phone inside the truck, and is believed to be the last ever picture taken of her. The family have said that they don't believe Bobby or Sherilyn took the photo, as Madison isn't looking towards the camera, and because she appears to look terrified. There are many theories surrounding this case, from the family getting lost, abduction, a cult sacrifice, a cartel killing, to a murder-suicide. However, over six years later, nobody is any closer to knowing what really happened on that day. Number 2 Amber Tuckerow. 20-year-old Amber Tuckerow went missing on August 18, 2010. The previous day, Amber, her 14-month-old son, and her female friend flew to Edmonton International Airport from her hometown of Fort McMurray, Alberta. Once the three arrived, they booked themselves into a motel in Nisku, close to the airport where they could spend the night. The next evening, Amber left the motel to catch a ride into the city of Edmonton. She decided to hitch a ride with an unknown male, which turned out to be the worst mistake of her life. The next day, after not hearing from her, Amber's friend informed her mother, who reported her missing. On August 28, 2012, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police released a 61-second cell phone recording to the public, which captured the conversation Amber had with the unknown man she got a ride with. Police didn't explain how they obtained the recording, but hoped someone could identify the man's voice. Here is the call. Where are we by? We're just heading south of uh, Beaumont, or north of Beaumont. We're heading north of Beaumont. Yo, where are we going? Just... No, this is a... Are you fucking kidding me? You better not take me. You better not take me anywhere. I don't want to go. I want to go into the city. Okay. Yo, we're not going in the city, are we? No, we're not. Then where the fuck are these roads going to? 50th Street. 50th Street. Are you sure? Absolutely. Yo, where are we going? 50th Street. 50th Street. 50th Street. Jeez, right? 
Just four days after the recording was released to the public, Amber's remains were found by horseback riders on a rural property near Leduc County. In the recording, the unknown driver claimed he was driving north. However, RCMP investigators believe that instead of driving north to the city, he drove southeast along the rural roads of Leduc County. Although police released the 61-second recording, the call actually lasted for 17 minutes which is practically the amount of time it would take to drive from the motel Amber was last seen to the location where her body was discovered. CBC News has learned that the call actually came from Amber's brother, who was locked up in the Edmonton Remand Center, where all outgoing calls are recorded. Police have said due to the recording, they have received hundreds of tips, but still have not identified the unknown driver. Number 3. Madeline McCann in late April of 2007, Kate and Jerry McCann went on holiday to Portugal with their three young children and a group of their friends. At 10.14 p.m. on Thursday, May 3rd, three-year-old Madeline McCann was reported missing. Portuguese police received a call claiming that the three-year-old British girl had been abducted. Earlier that night at around 7 p.m., the McCanns put their children to bed. They say that all three were asleep at around 8.30 p.m., they then left the apartment and met up with seven of their friends for dinner at a tapas bar, 50 yards across the pool from their apartment. The McCanns say that checks were made on the kids every half an hour to make sure they were safe. At around 9.05 p.m., Jerry McCann made his way to the ground floor apartment in Praia de Luz. He says all of the children were still asleep and Madeline was in her bed. At 9.30 p.m., one of the McCann's friends, Dr. Matthew Oldfield, checked on the children. He claims that the McCann's bedroom door was wide open, but as he heard no noise, he left without looking far enough into the room to see whether Madeline was in bed. At 10 p.m., Kate McCann checked the apartment. She says that she noticed the children's door was open wider than she remembered it being. When she entered the room, she claims that the window shutter and curtains were wide open and that Madeline was no longer in her bed. Kate quickly returned to the tapas bar where she began screaming that someone had taken her daughter. At 10.30 p.m., the resort activated its missing child search protocol, where 60 staff and guests, and later police, searched the resort through the night. In the first 24 hours of the investigation, many mistakes were made by police, one being the crime scene that was not fully secured, meaning around 20 people entered the apartment before it was closed off, contaminating any potential evidence. The McCanns quickly became suspects by Portuguese police, as they didn't buy their story and couldn't believe that they left their children unattended. They theorized that there had been a tragic accident and the parents had hid Madeline's body and staged the abduction scene. Although they were suspects, Kate and Jerry were allowed to leave Portugal and return to the UK in September of 2007. After a year-long investigation in July 2008, Portugal's Attorney General closed the case and the McCanns were no longer being treated as suspects. In 2013, a BBC show called Crime Watch showed a full reconstruction of the night in question, and released e-fit pictures of a man that was spotted by Mary and Martin Smith from Ireland after they told police they saw the mysterious male carrying a child matching Madeline's description at around 10 p.m., 500 yards from the McCann's apartment. They said that he was walking towards the beach, did not look like a tourist, and did not seem comfortable carrying the child. The show also released e-fits of a group of people that were spotted near the McCann's apartment on and around the day of the disappearance. Scotland Yard have theorized that Madeline may have disturbed a burglary. Unfortunately, there haven't been many other leads, but nearly nine years later, the McCann's still remain hopeful that Madeline is alive and will be found. The case still remains open. Number 4 Kaylin Lauder. 30 year old Kaylin Lauder went missing at around 7 p.m. on September 27, 2014. The circumstances in which she disappeared are very bizarre. 
In the morning, Louder had called 911 claiming that someone had broken into her condo in Murray, Utah, and believed the intruder was still in the house. She went on to say that she didn't see anyone, but she heard them talking. During the call, Louder yelled several times for the intruder to leave. Police investigated the report but found no evidence to suggest a break-in had occurred. Later that same day, Louder was caught on surveillance camera walking barefoot in the rain outside her condo with her dog. Police believe she appears to be having an animated conversation. At 7 p.m., for an unknown reason, Louder began to run. She left her dog, phone, money, keys, and car behind. This is the last time she was seen alive. Louder's mother had said in a statement that she spoke to her daughter that day and she seemed fine. Her cousin claims that she was cleaning her condo that day and was working on her resume as she had just been let go from her job as a social worker. Her family hired a private investigator to help the search for her. Two months after her disappearance on November 30th, Louder's body was discovered in the Jordan River in Utah, five miles from her home. An autopsy was performed but could not determine how she died. A toxicology report confirmed that there was nothing fatal or illegal in her system. Louder's family say they suspect foul play and do not believe the death was an accident as she had no history of mental illness. However, investigators disagree because the 911 call she made on September 27th was not the first time she had made a false claim. The previous day, she had reported a fight at a wedding that didn't happen, which has led them to believe she was showing delusional behavior. No one truly knows what happened to Kaylin Louder after she left the condo that day. Her family are still searching for answers. Number 5 the Disappearance of Timothy J. Pitson On the morning of May 11, 2011, Amy Joan Marie Fry Pitson traveled to the Green Man Elementary School and removed her only child from class and checked him out of the school. From there, Amy and her six-year-old son, Timothy J. Pitson, began their unexpected three-day road trip. Their first stop was the Brookfield Zoo in Illinois. After that, they traveled to the Key Lime Cove Resort where they spent the night. Timothy's father, James Pitson, reported his wife and son as missing once he went to collect his boy from school and found out his wife had already taken him out, which he found strange. The next day, Amy and Timothy traveled to the Kalahari Water Park Resort in Wisconsin Dells. Surveillance from the water park the next morning shows them both waiting in line to check out. Shortly after, at around 1.30 p.m., Amy called several of her family members and friends and explained that her and Timothy were fine. At 7.25 p.m., Amy went to a family dollar store in Winnebago, Illinois, where she purchased stationery. She then traveled to the nearby Sullivan's Foods, where she was spotted once again on a security camera. This time, however, there was no sign of Timothy. Her final journey was at around 11.15 p.m. where she checked into the Rockford Inn in Rockford, Illinois. The next day, at around 12.30 p.m., she was found dead by the inn's employees. She had taken her own life by ingesting an overdose of antihistamines and had slit her wrists. Amy left a suicide note and had sent two letters to her loved ones in the mail, which claimed that Timothy was safe and was taken somewhere where he will be well cared for. She also wrote that no one will ever find him, and that she can't take the risk of Jim hurting Tim because of her choices. Timothy's Spider-Man backpack, toys, and clothing were missing, as well as the clothes Amy was wearing when she checked out of the Kalahari Resort. Amy's mother has said that she did suffer with depression, but she was not a crazy person and never acted bizarrely. Timothy still remains missing as of February 2016. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to see more.